I've never ridden this bike before. Well, sort of. I have ridden BMW's K1600 GTL, most recently, last year in fact, after its latest update, in Bavaria no less. And I have to say, it was a surprisingly enjoyable experience. Surprising because the GTL is BMW's premier touring machine. It is designed to provide the smoothest, most comfortable and also rapid method of transporting two people across vast distances. As such, I expected it to be an expensive feat of technological and engineering excellence, which it is, but I was caught a little off guard by the amount of cheesy grinning and moronic giggling I was doing during my week with the bike. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I know. It's not a very attractive look, is it? But inside your helmet, you know, away from prying eyes. Yeah. Anyway, I caught myself doing this sort of thing quite frequently. Serious performance, serious distance smashing comfort, serious levels of technology, serious wind protection, serious power and torque, serious money as well. Forgive me for thinking that the riding experience would consequently be just as serious. But it turns out that when you put all those very serious elements together in the one bike, you end up with something that is almost parody. If Wiley Coyote had wanted to make a hyper super touring bike for one of his madcap escapades, he'd have ended up with something like the GTL. On the basis that too much of a good thing is never quite enough, I gratefully accepted the opportunity to ride this, the K1600B Grand America. What is it? Well, I think the shy and retiring name probably gives the game away. It is, as far as I can tell, a GTL for the US of A. Some rather ostentatious badging wouldn't normally be enough to get me on a bike, but since I enjoyed the GTL so much last year, and since my favourite K1600 so far is the bagger that I first rode about five years ago now, I think it was, and this is a more full dress version of that, and since this Grand America is clearly, though also quite subtly, better looking than the GTL, I thought, why not? And so, here I am, riding the GTL USA, quite appropriately, past a nuclear power station. Just there, in fact. Trillo nuclear power plant, I should perhaps say. An impressive technical tour de force that generates almost as much torque as the K1600, though not quite as smoothly. The view ahead to this very impressive wide-angle TFT screen is familiar, differing only slightly due to a, a changed handlebar arrangement. But it didn't take long for me to realise that I prefer this bike's ergonomics. I rode it here from Madrid, so about an hour and a half, and that was plenty enough for me to decide that the riding position and wind protection suit me more than the GTLs. The addition of footboards is a lovely touch. Super comfortable foot positioning when you're cruising, and since they put your plates right up against the engine block, they serve as useful foot warmers as well. Useful when the temperature is two degrees and there's the occasional snow flurry, that's for sure. I rode a F900R a naked bike to Madrid to swap for the Grand America and it was one of the most unpleasant, painful rides that I've had for many a year. But on the way back with heated seat and grips on max, those warming protective footboards, the immense wind protection, it was just so easy and I stayed nice and cosy and warm. And I was actually maintaining a, a much higher average speed than I had done on the supposedly sporty F900. But 
back to that riding position because although it seemed like more of a natural fit than I remember and somehow I felt more in control, more connected at all speeds, as far as I can tell it's actually pretty much identical to the GTLs. Seat height, the reach to and the height of the handlebar, the windscreen size, foot peg positioning, it's all the same. Okay, the handlebar mounting itself is different, but still puts everything in pretty much the same place. The only thing I can see that is different is the shape of the seat. There's more room to shift back on this Grand America, whereas the GTL very much holds you in position with a kind of deep bucket seat effect. While we're on the subject, the passenger seat here is now much lower than it is on the GTL too. Better for wind protection, but equally not as good for a passenger's unobstructed view ahead. It is though a year since I've ridden the GTL and I do have the memory of a, uh, what's it, you know, uh, oh I don't know, a retired goldfish. But even without the benefit of a back-to-back -back ride, this Grand America somehow, I'm sure, makes me feel less overwhelmed by the bike's admittedly impressive mass. The front half of the Grand America, apart from those footboards and the colour options, is near as damn it a mirror image of the GTL. It's only at the back that you start to see some differences. Differences that favour this bike in terms of its good looks. The panniers have a more pleasing shape and are mounted lower as are the exhaust canisters. The rear end is less of an eyesore in general because the pillion armchair and top box are also mounted lower so there's less impression of bulk at the tail end of the bike. Although obviously there still very much is some considerable architecture hanging out back there and on that ride back from Madrid in the snow flurries and Baltic temperatures, there was plenty of gusting windiness. The Grand America didn't like it so much, and, uh, and neither did I. It felt like a giant was occasionally reaching down, grabbing the top box and giving it a little wriggle. Quite unnerving it was at times, but when the weather is less angry, this is an eerily calm, solid platform of a bike. I say eerily because the sheer size of it suggests you will probably, or should probably, be bobbing and weaving and generally shimmying around once you start to break and turn and accelerate even slightly too vigorously. But Miraculously, you don't. It doesn't dive under even hard braking. It just sucks itself into the ground, flat and stable as you like. You can thank the electronically aided ABS Pro and BMW's very clever duo lever front end for magically disappearing all that weight. That's something the chassis and electronically adjustable suspension also managed to do very effectively. 367 kilo wet weight, 457 kilos with you on as well, not a problem sir. We'll make half of that disappear with the press of a button. And they do, because even in its softest road setting it corners without terrifying you. But engage dynamic mode and it goes from having a floaty soft ride quality where you can still get a sense of all that weight into a firmly suspended almost choppy ride quality that lets you take the the sort of liberties with this grand old lump of a motorcycle that should by all rights result in nothing more than a rather large embarrassing hole in the scenery making this 
two-wheeled middle finger to motorcycle physics move as equally impressively as it handles is an inline six-cylinder engine with 180 newton meters and 160 horsepower and a soundtrack well that deserves its own recording contract you will never tire of playing with this 9000 rpm wide musical instrument especially as it is complemented by a two-way quick shifter that works like a dream when you ride like well like a young person the exact opposite of this bike's average customer a customer that can now actually afford to buy a 600,000 round touring bike I was so ready to pronounce this the better looking obvious option to choose instead of the GTL I'd made my mind up before I'd even got back to the van after that first ride back from Madrid. But a confession first, I didn't read the spec sheet like I usually do before picking up a new bike. If I had done, I might not have caught such a fright when, well, when the Grand America decided that it wanted to kill me. If you happen to catch my GTL test last year, you may remember that I speed tested it on the German Autobahn. BMW claim, vaguely, that it will do over 200 kilometers an hour. In fact, I managed 228 kilometers an hour before the top speed limiter kicked in. I rashly assumed that the Grand America would feature the same sort of limit. It doesn't. Halfway past overtaking three nose-to-tail articulated trucks in a confident and not reckless manner, in fourth gear at an admittedly slightly legal speed, this bagger, with an extra box, decided to inform me that its top speed was in fact 167 kilometers an hour and it was not prepared to let me have any more. It caught me by surprise, to say the least, I tried again, it refused again. I eyed the oncoming traffic and thought perhaps I'd hit a lowered rev limiter and so I selected the next higher gear, fifth, and tried again. And again, it said no, 167 is your lot. Fortunately, 167 k's an hour is still much faster than your average truck, but still, I ended up spending more time on the wrong side of the road than I'd anticipated. I was not impressed. The trucker that I managed to slide back in front of was uh, also not very impressed with my superhero riding antics and gave me the full fog horn blast on his truck horn, but tangent here. Uh, <laughs> this bike has the best standard horn of any bike, so I could at least reply. Why the lower speed limit? Aerodynamics, perhaps? Though I have no idea why they might be any worse on the Grand America than the GTL. Surely the footboards don't warrant robbing you of 60 k's an hour worth of top speed. Maybe the intended American customer gets a bit bewildered at these sorts of velocities. But since they built and flew the space shuttle, that doesn't seem very likely. Maybe they're just too litigious over there and BMW is running scared of their lawyers. Whatever. It now means that the grand but slow America will now hit its top speed in third gear. One of motorcycling's greatest engines has been rendered impotent because, well, because of what exactly? I'm not sure. The result though is obvious. If you want what is arguably the best touring bike in the world with the best touring engine and the finest array of over-the-top electronic goodies to go with it, do not buy the very good-looking Grand America. Buy the slightly less good-looking GTL. Okay, thanks for watching the test. Maybe think about blessing us with a 
thumbs up or a sub or actually more importantly uh, share the content if you fancy more of this sort of stuff it would help us out enormously uh, and please don't write any comments about how scruffy I and my surroundings are my wife's gonna kill me anyway when she sees I've shot this footage of myself and the van in such um, disarray but you know what it's like I, I couldn't be bothered making everything pretty pretty since she's out walking Leia uh, the mini schnauzer my big schnauzer by the way is is here on this bench seat next to me so if you hear any snoring don't worry you're uh, you're not imagining things right back to the bike I just want to add that I understand if you would want to get the Grand America because you don't ever see you and your passenger needing to head north of 100 miles an hour I understand completely. If I was choosing though, and I was riding in Europe and might have some autobahn or not very heavily policed highways in my touring future, and I really wanted to exploit this amazing engine, then I would definitely go the ugly duckling route and choose the GTL. The standard bagger, which has the panniers, but not the top box, will, if I remember correctly, max out with an unlimited top speed that is up around the 260k an hour mark you might suggest that the armchair on the back of the Grand America is the reason that they've limited the speed so severely but I would remind you of the GTL with its even more pronounced armchair and that is only limited to 228 kilometers an hour it's a strange one that's for sure and it will be of concern to some but not others Moving on, let me just add that if you want a more detailed explanation of riding modes, the electronics in general, and plenty of the other delicious details of this tour de force of a motorcycle that retails for very nearly 30,000 euros in this guise, please have a look at my GTL report that covers all that sort of stuff in more detail. I'll link it below. And uh, that's it for this video. Please check in on us again in the near future. We've got some uh, great tests of bikes and of roads coming up in the next few weeks. Hopefully, I'll see you in one of those. So, cheers for now.